Hello, everybody. I'm Susanna DeBaca, the president of Business Publications Corporation and the publisher of DSM Magazine. And I want to welcome you to our Lifting the Veil series on the mental health effects of COVID-19 called Life Interrupted. At DSM, we normally do a publication and an event dedicated to mental health every fall. But when the pandemic started, we quickly realized that there would be short and long-term mental health effects on the community. This series came together very quickly in record time, thanks to our team and to a terrific slate of sponsors. This is the final panel in a series of six and the topic, diversity and inclusion interrupted could not be more timely or more critical. Before we get started, I wanna give a shout out to the entire DSM team for your great work on this series. We're gonna be using Zoom today, and I hope you'll bear with us if we have any uh, technical challenges. I also want to give a very big thanks to our sponsors who made this program possible. Our presenting sponsor is Delta Dental of Iowa. Our supporting sponsors are United Way of Central Iowa, Clive Behavioral Health, which is a partnership with Mercy One. And our sustaining sponsors are, are Mid-Iowa Health Foundation, Employee and Family Resources, Make It Okay, UCS Healthcare, and Des Moines University. Today, we're going to be focusing on equity and inclusion interrupted. We felt passionately about including this particular topic when we designed this series because we know that pandemics exacerbate existing inequities. And in a short time, we have already seen those inequities exposed. Economic disparities, lack of access to health care, food and housing insecurity, and isolation we're already escalating within diverse and vulnerable populations. When just last week, we witnessed the unconscionable murder of George Floyd, followed by both peaceful and violent demonstrations. We will address various populations today as we planned, but we are going to focus much of our conversation on racial inequities, in particular those affecting people of color. And I will take one moment to notice that right now at noon, hospitals across Iowa are taking a knee in solidarity. So we'll take just a moment to be quiet in solidarity as well. Our discussion could not be more relevant today and ongoing discussion on these topics will be critical in the future. Here's how the program is going to work today. I'll share a video, I'll introduce our speakers, and then I'll start the panel. At the end, if we have time, I'll open it up for questions from the audience. And during the entire panel, you may chat your comments or questions on the chat function during the program. But let, first, let's hear from some community leaders and members about how the pandemic is affecting mental health in diverse communities. Luke, can you roll the video? Police violence is a public health issue. Racism is a public health issue. COVID-19 is disproportionately killing more black people than anybody else. And your black coworker is not okay right now. This global pandemic has amplified the extreme disparities that so many folks are experiencing in our country. Diversity, equity, and inclusion work must continue so that these folks are not forgotten. Not participating in the things that make me happy or pull me out of that funk are things that are now imperative for my health, for my physical well-being. But for my mental well-being, those are things that can be really triggering or troubling for me. The way COVID has had such a disproportionate effect on deaths and illnesses of persons of color has been an enormous burden. 
And so I think when we get on the other side of COVID, I hope that we as a society, both locally and regionally and nationally, will address some of these economic issues and um, living conditions and a lack of access to health care will address those issues that really have been so problematic. We are not okay and it's time to talk about that because black livelihoods matter. Very powerful video and a very nice lead in to the conversation that we're going to be having. So I'm delighted to welcome and introduce our panelists. Our first panelist is Dr. Yogi Shah. He is the Chief Medical Officer and Vice President of Medical Affairs for Broadlands Medical Center, where he has also served as the founding director of palliative care and as a geriatrician in the Broadlands Geriatric and Memory Center. Next, we have Matt McCoy, who is owner of, the, of Resource Development Consultants and a member of the Board of Supervisors of Polk County. Matt served in both the Iowa Senate and House and was the first openly gay member of the Iowa General Assembly. Shireen Connor is currently working as a mental health and addictions therapist in private practice at Thriving Families Counseling Services in the Des Moines metro area and is an adjunct instructor for the University of Iowa School of Social Work and Simpson College. She has a background in working in diverse populations. Next, someone you recognize from the video, Rima McCoy McDade is the executive director of Central Iowa Center for Independent Living and serves as the treasurer for the National Council on Independent Living and chair for the Autistic Self Advocacy Network. A nationally recognized leader, her vocation is mobilizing marginalized persons, the working class, people of color, folks with disabilities, religious minorities, and others. She also wanted everyone to know she is a single mother. And last but not least is Deidre Dejir. Deidre represents the Financial Empowerment Network at DMAC. Deidre Dejir has dedicated her career to community and small business development. She made history by being the first African-American nominated by a major party in the state of Iowa when she ran for the Iowa Secretary of State position. So panelists, we are thrilled that you can be here. I also want to thank and introduce uh, Delta Dental of Iowa, which is our presenting sponsor. For more than 50 years, Delta Dental has been improving the health and smiles of Iowans. Delta Dental provides dental and vision benefits to more than 1.2 million Iowans. Most recently, Delta Dental and its foundation committed up to 10.5 million in COVID-19 relief funds to Iowa dentists for claims advances, as well as grants for nonprofits. Since 2002, Delta Dental has invested more than 42 million to improve the oral health and overall health of Iowans. And I'd like to introduce Beth Jones, who is the Director of Community Impact with Delta Dental. Beth? Hi, thank you very much. Welcome everyone. As the Director of Community Impact for Delta Dental, I have the opportunity to lead our foundation focused on oral and overall health and have been working in the public health and funding field for over 20 years. We are living through two public health crises happening at once. As a health and wellness company, we understand the importance of physical health and emotional well being, but no ongoing conversations addressing diversity, equity, and inclusion are critical. We're honored to support today's conversation. Thank you to DSM for giving us this platform and to all of you for joining us. Thank you to Beth and thank you again to Delta Dental. And now let's go ahead and get started. I'm going to ask all of our panelists the same question to start out with. Um, and that's the big question. Um, and I'm gonna ask each one of them really to off, um, answer this from their own professional vantage point. Um, so first a statement, pandemics exacerbate existing inequities. And the question is, 
what are the biggest challenges to mental health in diverse or vulnerable populations right now? And we'll start with you, Dr. Shaw. Thank you. Thank you, Susanna, for again, for this panel and this topic. Yes, mental uh, health have become more and come out more because of this pandemic. And overall, pandemic has brought up the worst thing what used to be there before and it brought it out. So let me let me divide this existing conditions into three broad topics and then try to dissect a little bit more. The first one is pre-existing both health and mental health conditions. The second big topic which affects mental health is uh, we call as in, in health, the social determinants of health. And the third one is global broad systemic issues. So the first one in mental health, unfortunately for minorities, African-American in particular, mental health has been about 20% higher than many of the, especially the white community, affecting more depression, more rates of suicide, more post-traumatic stress disorder, and more ADHD. So there's already a 20% higher rate pre, pre pandemic. The second big issue, which I did my MPH on the topic, and that is about the effect of social determinants of health on our health and mental health, on physical and mental health. So what do I mean by that? That unfortunately, only 20% of our health depends on clinics and hospitals, only 20%. 30% of our health depends on our behavior, what I eat, whether I smoke and drink excess, or do I get physical exercise? That's 30%. So the bulk of our health, mental and physical health, depends on something called social determinants of health. Where did I finish my high school? Am I employed? Do I have transportation? Do I have access to healthcare? And so in nutshell, Susanna, this is, is like our zip code is more important than my genetic code. Let me repeat that. So zip code is more important than genetic code and that affects the mental health. And the third big area in mental health uh, for African-Americans especially is the systemic issue. And what does it mean? There's a disbelief, there's a disbelief uh, amongst Afri more, many African-Americans in our healthcare system. And, and then second is the disbelief that the mental health is an issue. So those are the bigger issues uh, and many we need to deal with uh, one at a time. Very serious. Matt, um, from your perspective, what are the biggest challenges to mental health in diverse or vulnerable populations right now? Well, there are several challenges to mental health in diverse and vulnerable communities. And one of the things the pandemic has uh, brought about is for the very first time, at the emergency management table, uh, we've uh, placed Liz Cox and Polk County Mental Health Services to help us through this pandemic and specifically address the mental health needs of various vulnerable communities. Um, the, the key issues are uh, low income communities are under resourced for mental health professionals and access to quality mental health. There is the systemic discrimination and the economic prospects, which are low for people of color and also for people of sexual minorities. Um, and what that does is it creates unstable income and also unstable benefits. So uh, a person might be employed today um, with or without benefits. If they do get benefits, they might start treatment for mental health and then lose those uh, benefits. And then obviously trauma, such as uh, childhood traumas, homelessness, uh, sexual or physical abuse or drug or alcohol dependency in families, underserved by providers because of lack of funding and resources because mental health services is not a pros profitable business venture for most hospital or medical networks. And then finally, uh, cultural stigmas that are associated with reaching out for help. Thank you. 
It's a very big, big question, isn't it? Um, so now I'll um, ask uh, Shireen the same one. Um, what are the biggest challenges to mental health in diverse or vulnerable populations right now? Yes, um, and, and then in reality, I don't have a lot of different things to say than Dr. Shaw or Matt, um, but um, in particular, from my perspective, I would say not only is it like the uh, lack of awareness and education, um, kind of going with Dr. Shaw's uh, explanation about the zip code and where you come from, um, that's a big um, indicator as far as why people may not understand mental health or um, the different effects or the outcomes that it may have. They just don't have a proper understanding of that. I think that's changed a lot uh, with time and awareness, um, things like this that make uh, mental health even more of a priority, um, but there's still, it's still lacking in a lot of areas. Um, so that's a, that's a one area in particular. Again, going with kind of what Matt was saying, cultural stigma is huge. And especially in the African American community, um, it's not, um, it's seen as weak, it's seen as sick for people to ask for help and reach out. And the last thing people want you to see is their vulnerabilities. And so um, as a mental health therapist, I'm always seeing um, people, you know, coming in to services, but it's um, being pushed there for some reason or another. It might be from family or friends, um, but people really struggle with opening up um, at the beginning of their therapeutic um, journey just because of that stigma alone. Um, the last thing um, is really about the inaccessibility. And I think that's one of the biggest problems that I see as a therapist is um, whether it's through the financial area, uh, Matt kind of got into that as well as far as the um, insurance and, and financially being able to afford mental health services, that's a big um, reason, but it's also about proximity and the fact that we don't have a lot of providers in those low income areas, um, as well as um, being able to, for people to travel. Um, low income people may not have driver's license or they may have bus passes. Um, even further than that, we were talking about people in rural communities who don't even have access to those levels of transportation. And so um, there are some things that have been changing over the last few months with COVID and everything to help with those areas, but um, they're seen as being temporary. So we really are fighting to make that change um, at the local and the government level. Thanks. So before I go to Rima, I want to point out um, to you that we do have real-time closed captioning available for this event. If you want to access that, just go to the bottom toolbar and click the closed caption button to turn it on. I should have done that at the, the beginning. Um, so Rima, what about you? What are the biggest challenges to mental health um, in diverse uh, and vulnerable populations that you're seeing right now? So... Before I dive into that, I just, I wanna recognize that we're talking about some very heavy things right now. And so I'm, I'm, I'm sensing that we all need to take a collective breath really quickly. So inhale, exhale, okay. The, the flip side of crisis is opportunity. And it, we're talking a lot about some of the unmet needs that, that we are experiencing in central Iowa. But the, the upside of identifying what those unmet needs are is uh, it presents us with the opportunity to explore solutions so that we can make this city that we live in um, equitable and just for all. So I just wanna put that out there. Disabled people are the largest marginalized group, not only in central Iowa or Iowa or the US, or the, but also the planet. And so I'm not going to necessarily talk explicitly about people with disabilities, but recognize that Black, Indigenous, and other people of color are also members of the disabled community. And so just think about that in the context of what we're talking about. Contending with everything that, that, that we're all contending with as far as the pandemic, as far as civil unrest, as far as coming to terms with the systems of inequity that we all live in, couple that with also being a person that experiences a disability. So 
that in and of itself um, can be very impactful for the mental health of, of disabled people who are also multiply marginalized in, in other ways, including being racially marginalized. Last Tuesday, I was facilitating CISL's weekly staff meeting. And in the middle of that, um, an individual sent me the video of George Floyd's murder. And the, the heading was, have you seen this? Oh my gosh. And I'm in the middle of being in professional mode, leading a meeting, and this image pops up on my computer screen. And I have to just keep on, because I'm the one that's facilitating the meeting. But I, I, I was deeply traumatized in that moment. And I bring that up because it's an imperative that we understand that we as, as leaders in the business and nonprofit sector are working with colleagues, coworkers, subordinates who are traumatized right now. Uh, and so collectively, I have, I have a lot of concerns about the, the mental health of, of all of us. And as I, as I indicated in, in the video, you know, racism is a public health issue. Police violence is a public health issue. COVID-19, as we all know, is a public health issue, but we talk about it in the context of the physical impacts of, of COVID-19. There are mental impacts to COVID-19 that we need to talk about because they tie into racial disparities. Black people are disproportionately dying of COVID-19 um, in comparison to our fellow white citizens. Disabled people who live in institutional settings locally and across the country are, are dying in disproportionate rate to everybody else. And you know, that, that's, that is weighing on the, the collective psyche of all of us, certainly, but most especially those of us who are multiply marginalized. And, and so you know, we have to take this into consideration because the reality is, is that society has permanently changed in a very short period of time. And unfortunately, you know, the, the, the infrastructure that, that we experience in the state of Iowa isn't necessarily equipped to contend with that. Iowa is currently number 50, 50 out of 50 states with regards to availability for inpatient beds at mental health facilities. How are we going to proactively accommodate this new norm given the infrastructure that, that we, we have. So that's a question that we have to keep in mind as we're keeping everything else in mind as well. Well, I think we may take a number of deep breaths in and out during this panel. You're right, we're, we're talking about really, really deep topics, um, but incredibly important conversations. So, so thank you for that and for reminding us to breathe in and out. Deidre, um, what about you? What do you see as the biggest mental health effects on diverse and vulnerable populations right now? You're on mute. There we go, sorry about that. Uh, so obviously I'm not a, a mental health care professional uh, by any stretch of the imagination. Um, but from a social vantage point, what I see is the biggest risk is for the people in our community who do have access to mental health services and who are trying to take those steps um, to seek care for a number of reasons, whether they be uh, systemic reasons, um, um, whatever. I, I think a big part of overcoming some of these challenges and learning to cope is, is, is also understanding that on the other side of this thing, that there's hope, there's faith, there, there's, there's an understanding that um, the systemic challenges that I've had to endure up to now, someone's working on that. And, and I think that that is a, a large part of what our community is dealing with right now, faith that we are going to see a resolution, one that includes the voices of African Americans, where African Americans are a part of a process. That, that's, it's, it's sometimes mind boggling to believe that you know, we, we try to resolve some of our challenges that exist in our communities without the perspective of those folks in our communities. And, and I think that that really um, is, is challenging the mental health of so many and, and even stimulating mental health crises as we speak. Mm -hmm. 
Well, thank you for that sort of broad overview. And now we're gonna go into some questions that are really specific to the um, chair that each one of you sit in, so to speak. So um, Dr. Shah, I'll start with you. We are seeing the stress of the pandemic manifest in many ways, anger, violence, depression. What are you experiencing in terms of changes in mental health and how can we develop empathy for people with these reactions? You're on mute still. It's a, it's a good, good topic to discuss. Uh, so what we are seeing here at Broadlawns Medical Center as our visits, especially for mental health related topics have gone up by 20%. Uh, both for mental health issues, uh, as I mentioned, depression, anxiety, um, post-traumatic stress disorder, and unfortunately, also for addiction. Uh, being at home, uh, people are uh, diverting and having more consumption of addictive substance, alcohol being one of them. And as you might have heard, the alcohol consumption has gone up nationally. So that, that's our challenge. Uh, and what, what's our, how to develop empathy? I, I, supporting, supporting the cause, supporting people who are doing it and being with them. Uh, look, unfortunately, what, what uh, Sharon, you mentioned is that nationally, even though we are 12.7 in our African American community percentage wise, unfortunately, only 2% of our psychiatrists, 2 percentage of only 2% are psychiatrists, which are African American, 2% are psychotherapists who are African American, and 2% or fewer are social worker who are African American. So we, we need to consider that into equation also. Very important point. Um, the next question is from Matt, and this is again, an enormous question. Uh, there are many drivers of poverty and many mental health issues that stem from them. Can you discuss how issues like hunger and housing and wage inequity are interrelated and affect mental health? Well, thank you. That's a great question. And obviously, there, there can be no real um, access to mental health and uh, the ability to receive good mental health if you haven't met your basic needs of food, clothing, shelter, um, which is, is one of the major drivers. One of the things that we've invested in in Polk County is trying to provide uh, adequate housing services, uh, trying to make sure that there is enough affordable housing. Uh, it, is a, it is a challenge that we deal with every single day. Um, we invest a great deal of money in our homeless shelters to try to help people move from homelessness because most people are homeless um, for less than 90 days. And the myth is that a lot of people are homeless forever. Most people are going through a transition and most of those transitions involve a serious uh, mental health issue um, involving that person. Um, the other thing that we need to consider is there's a cost to providing all of these services. And one of the things that we talked about and when Dr. Shaw referenced zip codes was under-resourced communities. And under-resourced communities means there's not enough mental health professionals to serve the community and that, and that there's not enough profit motive in it to actually set up and stand up a proper mental health facilities for individuals. In addition to that, we have a huge cost that we're paying for our jail population and our prison population that are really associated with either chemical dependency or mental health. People that don't belong in our institutional facilities for corrections, uh, but people that do deserve and need our, our assistance with mental health uh, services. So those are some of the challenges that we face every single day in Polk County. And when we we try to determine what that cost is to society, um, it's very difficult to put a number on it. But those are some of the obstacles that people face um, just, just to get the mental health they need. Thank you, Matt. Uh, my next question is um, for Shireen, and this is a, I think, breathe in, breathe out question. Um, but what advice do you have for people who are so 
greatly and deeply affected by the murder of George Floyd and the ensuing protests and violence that they, they simply struggle to function. Oh, goodness. Again, another big question. And like you said, another big breathe in, breathe out moment. Um, I guess I first want to identify the fact that like everyone has been struggling with COVID-19 and the grief and the trauma that has been coming because of that. So now we have a whole community of people who are grieving. And then on top of that, we all had to watch this traumatic event happen on live, you know, live on uh, TV and, 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 and videotaped for everyone to be able to see uh, with the death of George Floyd. Um, grief on grief. And so you're talking about some really complex feelings and emotions uh, that people are dealing with um, every day now. Um, confusion, um, frustration, anger, violence, you're seeing all of those things. And so I guess as far as advice, some of the things that we need to remember to do is um, we have to limit our use of social media and be careful about what we're, where are, we're getting our information from because there's so much information out there that can easily gaslight us and, and take us to that point of being angry and extreme. Um, not always, but there's definitely some of those things that are doing that on purpose and some of those things that are doing that unintentionally. Um, and so we have to be aware of what those things are doing to us um, as individuals and then us as a society as well. So again, being careful about where we're getting that information from and trying to, to understand it as much as possible. Um, I think that one of the biggest things that I work on with people when they come to therapy is their lack of coping skills. We teach people how to live and, and enjoy life, but we really don't teach them how to cope with those major events that are going on in life um, or that could possibly come up. We don't prepare them for those circumstances. And so learning how to cope, finding healthy ways of doing it. So again, with what Dr. Shaw said, as far as the addiction rate going up, as far as um, use of alcohol and, and other substances, um, people are being cooped up, people are emotional and they can't figure out a way to deal with those things other than to fill in those holes, you know, um, those emotional holes with, with substances. Um, so it's really important to find healthy ways of coping, whether that's journaling, exercising, eating healthy. Um, we don't think about how eating can really help with our mood and our stability, but it, it really matters to eat healthy uh, while we're all kind of cooped up during this pandemic time. Um, it, it has a huge effect on the brain and on the body itself. Um, and then I think the last thing as far as all of this stuff is just remembering to take care of each other, to talk to each other. Um, you're not going through this alone. So it's so important to remember that, you know, you have children, you have colleagues, you have friends, family who are all going through this with you. Talk to each other, support each other. And when it comes to the worst of the worst and you can't cope and that, that friendship and that connection isn't working anymore, talk to a therapist, talk to someone professionally who can help you with that. That's what we're here for. And we're prepared and we're ready for that. Um, so, you know, whether you go on psychology today and look up a therapist that looks like you and speaks your language, um, whether you look for someone um, through 211, that's a great resource as well. Find somebody, talk to someone and that will help immensely, hopefully, and help you with the skills to be able to cope through such a tragic time right now. Great advice. Uh, Rima, my question for you is um, really through your, your lens. People with disabilities are being affected differently by the pandemic, but are often overlooked. What do we need to know as employers or neighbors or community members to support them at this moment? Great question. So what struck me pretty immediately um, with regards to the disability community and the pandemic was, well, let me, let me backtrack a little bit. So one of the things that we do at CISL is support people with disabilities to find and maintain employment. So we're constantly in conversation and negotiation with prospective employers about uh, bringing somebody on board who, uh, who we're working with who's a job seeker. And many of the folks that, that we 
support um, are, are qualified and with reasonable accommodations would be a wonderful addition to, to any team in central Iowa. And uh, that includes individuals that um, would, would be best thrive um, in a work situation that, that included um, a telework capacity to it, uh, an ability to work from home. Pre-pandemic, what we heard a lot from prospective employers, oh, we can't modify this job so that, so that a person can do it from home. That's just, we, we can't do that. that. We've never done that before. We, I, we wouldn't even know how to begin doing that. The pandemic hits and people start working from home. It's amazing. We know now that the, the, the capacity to work from home is much more of a reality for employers than what they may have thought it was prior to the pandemic. So the pandemic, the crisis of the pandemic presented the opportunity for employers, not only locally, but across the country, just to, to think very differently about what can we do to get this, these jobs done? And so you've, you've got scores of people who are working from home now, um, and that's wonderful. I would invite employers to keep that in mind once the pandemic wraps up. This is something that can be continued indefinitely, and it not only benefits disabled people, um, making, making work flexible um, just makes sense in, in the 21st century. And so, that, that certainly is a biggie. Working from home from the vantage point of race. Only one out of five black Americans has the ability to work from home. The vast majority of black Americans work in positions that it's just physically in, impossible to work from home. So we're talking service industry, direct support professional type positions. You know, you, you, you can't, you can't provide child care in a child care facility from home. And so that is something that we also have to keep in mind. There's a privilege to being able to work from home that some of us are not able to tap into, unfortunately. And so I, I want to put that out there um, and, and make sure that, that we're all very cognizant of that. Thank you. And Deidre, your, your question is not dissimilar to the earlier one, um, but all of this is going on at once. What advice do you have for people who are living in fear for their health and their livelihoods, their lives, and then their children's lives all at the same time? Susanna, just a clarification. Is this um, specific to African Americans? Um, I think you can answer it any way that you would like. Okay, appreciate that. Um, so as it relates to just the community at large, let's just take African Americans out of, this, out of the equation for the first part of this answer. Um, you know, I, I would ask you to think a little bit more broadly um, and to really consider how we got to where we are. Your livelihood is important. Your children's lives are important. But the, the task at hand is that there is a community of people who are literally hurting and they've been challenged to, 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 to achieve the American dream for centuries. And, and right now is a moment in time in which our country can resolve it. COVID has given us that opportunity to resolve it. And, and so we want to focus on how we can resolve it at this point in time. And, 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 it, and it takes a, a, a lot of work. And it takes work that hasn't looked like the work that we put in in the past. Um, and, and I'm asking for those people to, to stand with us in solidarity as we um, you know, encounter this process. And if you can be a part of the change, I beckon you to come and join us to be a part of it. Whether you're black, white, Latinx, whatever you are, I'm asking you to be a part of it because it's gonna take each and every one of us. And so let's set aside our fear for once because we're just people. We're upset, we're angry, we're agitated, but at the end of the day, we bleed the same blood. And it is evident in all the statistics that our African-American community is disproportionately impacted and it doesn't have to be that way. It doesn't have to be that way, but it takes listening to the voices of African-Americans, especially our youth. Our youth have been caged in their homes. Now, now I won't say caged, that's an exaggeration, but they have been bound in their homes for a long time. They would typically be at school 
to, to, to talk out this type of social discourse when they, when they see a murder or when they see injustice happen. They would typically be able to convene with each other, but because of COVID, they have been socially distanced from advocating for themselves, right? And, and, when, and when, they, when they chose to, to, to make those steps to listen, we silenced them in so many ways. Whether we agreed with what was coming out of their mouths or not, we silenced them. And what we did by silencing, and silencing them is telling them that their issue was not important, that their feelings didn't matter, that they weren't valuable. Maybe we didn't mean it when we were silencing them, but that's how they took it. That's how they took it. And these are our babies and they're learning just like we're learning. They don't get how government works. They just see that as a black woman, they're probably gonna make 50 to 60 cents on the dollar and they're mad about that. They, why, why should they graduate from, from high school when, when that's the wage they're gonna get on the back end of things, right? And so let's make sure that we are not silencing our youth. If you have an opportunity to hear their voice, listen. I went to a rally on, on Sunday, Monday, all these uh, days are, are, are merging. But to hear their hearts, to hear their souls, it's real. It's real. And we are faced with an opportunity to strengthen our youth at this point in time, rather than further traumatize their already traumatizing existence. Well, I took too long for the broad one, so I won't go to Black folks. I apologize. That was, that was excellent. That was excellent. Okay, well, now we'll have a deep breath for just one moment. I want to remind you of a couple of things. Um, more mundane, but if you um, uh, enjoy DSM or find DSM of value, I hope that you will look for our newsletters. I hope you will subscribe to our publication, which uh, not only covers the Des Moines community, but also a number of community issues like this. Um, please mark your calendar for two different things. One, our normal Lifting the Veil event on November 19th. We'll talk about mental health um, and unveil a publication on that date. But um, sooner, on um, June 23rd, we will have our DSM unveiling. That will include the unveiling of our annual inclusion magazine. We've been doing a magazine on inclusion for many years now, and it also could not be more timely. And we will also be announcing from Business Publications Corporation, a major new company-wide initiative to combat a key driver of inequity. So that's at noon. We hope you'll tune in. You will get some information um, if you were registered for this event, but, but mark those dates and, and we would welcome you. So the next question I have, we've talked about a lot of very, very big and heavy topics, um, but I just wanna ask uh, the panelists if they have any advice on resources and we're gonna toggle back and forth between some resources that the panelists have given us and then folks on other panels, if you are experiencing difficulties or others that you know, um, everything from NAMI to Cecil to United Way, some resources for LGBTQ uh, people and youth. Um, but let me ask in particular, um, why don't we go to um, the people who are in behavioral health, so Shireen, um, any um, specific um, resources you'd like to point out? Um, I think you guys named a lot of good ones, and so I will just add a few more. Um, there's a um, new site counseling center, there's thriving families counseling services. Those particularly have um, people of color very much involved in their services. So um, if you were looking for people that look like us and are diverse, <laughs> um, then those are two really good ones that have a full staff that are um, people of color or um, more inviting. Um, the psychology of today is a great resource just because if you're looking for a specific therapist with specific skills, you have a whole web page to look at um, that's just based on the therapist's um, background and their information. So that's a great resource as well. Um, SAMHSA is known for addictions, but they have a distress hotline that can be called. Uh, I believe you guys already had 211 up there and then Your Life Iowa um, is also already up there as well. So those were just some things that I could think of off of hand. Um, and based on some of the questions I might have, I've seen 
Um, people, there are not a lot of agencies that have people of color, Spanish speaking. Um, so those are very, um, I know, profitable and, and people are always looking for those. Um, if you're ever looking for um, like those particular services, there's also new sites like um, the Iowa Accountability Project. They're making an African-American domestic violence list for providers. Um, and then I do know that like Ariana, it's a website specifically for providers of color, again, just to be a specific um, uh, resource for people who are looking for minority uh, providers. Um, Dr. Shaw, anything that you would add to this? Sure, yeah, there are two numbers I'd like to share with the audience. Uh, they are both for from Broadlands and they are actually on the screen also. The, the one, the crisis team is 24 seven at Broadlands and the number there is 282-5752. And the other, other resource at Broadlands uh, I feel is important to talk about and promote is the actual observation center. We have crisis observation center. Again, that's 24-7 uh, uh, on our campus. Uh, and that is very helpful for people who just want to be away from home and spend some time, uh, need appropriate time. Uh, and that's number is 282 five, seven, four, two. So that's that. those are the two I would promote from Broadlawn's point of view. That's wonderful. And there's more in the chat function. Um, and we'll also send these uh, numbers out to you in a follow-up email if you're an attendee. So you don't have to worry about capturing them. So now I'm going to ask a question to um, Rima and Matt. Um, how can our community overall listen, empathize, and support all our citizens. So um, Matt, let's start with you. I mean, ultimately what we, what we have to do is we have to listen to each other. And I think that uh, what this pandemic has taught us and what, uh, um, what we're learning uh, about systemic racism since the George Floyd killing um, is that we have been doing a poor job listening to each other. And I also feel like so many people are running at a, uh, what I would call a low boil, and it just takes the slightest, um, it takes the slightest uh, insult or um, comment to set people off. So I know anxiety is really high, and that's why I kind of laughed uh, uh, when Rima started with, we all need to take a deep breath because I feel that. I feel that as an elected official. And so one of the things that I think we need to do is, is we need to spend time listening to each other um, and, and really focus on, um, focus on meeting people's needs where they are and uh, not uh, where we are. And that's, there's a huge difference between that as well, uh, recognizing that we're not all in the same place on that and that's okay. And everybody is expressing themselves in their own way. And, and that's the other uh, element I think that I'm finding is that while some people want to um, uh, protest in the streets, some people want to uh, write messages on social media, some people want to write checks to causes that they believe in, everybody needs to do their thing that helps us better understand and cooperate and live in unity together. Great, Rima, what about you? Um, what, how, can, how can we all be supporting each other? So in the mental health world, uh, we talk about something called positive behavior supports. And it might go by something else now. I, my grad school days are far behind me. Uh, but the concept of positive behavior supports is simple and it's this. It's about supporting people to get their needs met so that their behavior doesn't escalate and become what we refer to in the mental health world as an interfering behavior. And so that I want to dovetail into to my next, uh, the next part of my comment. And uh, I, I, like many black people recently have been inundated with quotations from, from Martin Luther King Jr. And so I, I use his quotations very sparingly, but this one makes sense given the context. And that is that a riot is the voice of the unheard. 
And so we have seen a lot of media coverage with regards to quote unquote riots or civil unrest locally, obviously nationwide as well. And uh, I want to challenge everybody that's, that's with us this afternoon to think about that behavior as being what happens when positive behavior supports have not been um, enforced or reinforced prior to the, the, the onset of that behavior. We are, have a population of folks that, as, as many of us on the panel have indicated in a variety of ways, are fed up, are frustrated, are angry, and it's time to hear them. And when we're hearing them, we have to be very mindful and intentional with regards to the tools that we're using to hear. And so with the, the civil unrest that we've seen in the media, we've also seen a lot of reaction from, um, from entities that, that provide structure to our society. And so we've seen law enforcement officers react in a variety of different ways um, that, that do not translate to listening. You know, we've seen um, mandates be put into place that, that are intended to um, control crowds, but in, a, in effect actually silence people. And that is not listening either. And so, Yes, civil unrest is, is frightening to behold, um, and, and the urge to contain that is, is definitely an organic thing, especially if you are a person that's in a position of authority and has the ability to do that. I want to challenge everybody that's listening, however, to think about rioting or civil unrest or, or even just outright acts of violence um, from a more meta vantage point. What is happening here? Is this the problem or is this a symptom of a bigger problem? <laughs> Let's focus on what the problem is so that 50 years from now, I'm not 90 years old protesting still with a sign um, attached to my wheelchair. You know, it breaks my heart seeing people that were involved in the civil rights movement 50 years ago out there and back at it again, um, you know, 60, 70, 80 years old with their signs. And they're, you know, some of the signs are kind of humorous and they, they, they reference, I can't believe that I'm out here protesting again. Well, you know, that's really heartbreaking. And, and we've got, as Deidre very eloquently articulated, we've got young people that are coming of age right as we speak and they're seeing this happen and they learned in high school that oh the civil rights movement took care of all this stuff and actually that's not true so let's seize the opportunity to take care of it now that's great uh i had hoped we would do a wrap with everybody just a real quick 30 seconds but this is a this is a talk that a group that needs more than 30 seconds each so i am going to ask Deidre if you could give us some parting thoughts and then we'll thank our spouse. She's like, oh my God, you put me on the spot. Any, any just quick wrap that you think for the next few minutes and then we'll do a, a little bit um, of a, a thank you again um, and we'll let people uh, go. But Deidre? Mute, you're on mute. Thank you. So I, I think I started the conversation talking about a narrow vision. And in order for us to move forward, we have to broaden our vision. And what that looks like is including perspectives, um, a part of the solution table from point A to point B, however long it takes. And I think that we have to be very intentional about that. I mean, just, just think of it from just a practical perspective. What would you do if you went to a restaurant and everything was already ordered for you? Mm. Without your input, without your thought, without your dietary restrictions, not knowing if you were on Weight Watchers or whatever, you wouldn't like it. You wouldn't like it. And, and, and you might be saying, well, we don't do that for all communities. Well, if, if that is what's working for those communities, keep doing it that way. But what we've realized is that approach does not work for the African American community because the disparities are getting larger the lives, the, 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 the murder rates are getting higher. 
you know, the, the, the symptoms are showing up and it's impacting our community from, from the inside out. And, and, and we're asked to be strong and we want to be strong, but at the end of the day, we got to be a part of this solution. And, and it's not just me. It's not just Rima. Um, it's not just Charmaine. It's not, it's not just the people you see on this phone call. It's, it's the person who you see walking down the street who maybe, maybe, maybe you don't know them. It, it may be the person that you're sitting next to at church. It may be the person, that, it may be your coworker. You never know. But, but the fact of the matter is that we've got to stand strong together in lockstep, understanding that this will be difficult, understanding that, that we will be stretching our limits, but also knowing and believing that in doing it this way, it's going to result in an outcome that's good for everyone, not just Black people. It's good for everyone. Well said. Um, I want to say thank you to all of our panelists, to uh, Dr. Shaw, to Matt, to Charmaine, Rima, Deidre. You were fantastic. We could talk for hours and hours, and I wish we could talk for hours and hours. Um, and I want to give a special shout out to the DSM team. This is our final uh, panel, but you've done an amazing job in making the series happen. Christine Richelli, Luke Manderfeld, Emily Schultz, Rochelle Kelberg, Rebecca Zoot, Yolanda Crystal, Sean Rakina, Ariana Sundin, Stacey Thompson, Jason Swanson, Eileen Jackson, Becky Hotchkiss, and of course, Connie Weimer. Thank you. And I want to thank our panel or our sponsors again, in particular, Delta Dental, our presenting sponsor. Our supporting sponsors, United Way of Central Iowa and Clive Behavioral Health, a partnership with Mercy One, and our sustaining sponsors, Mid-Iowa Health, Des Moines University, uh, Family uh, and Resource uh, Center, UCS Healthcare, and Make It Okay. This needs to be an ongoing dialogue. We are grateful uh, for you tuning in. We look forward to talking more. Words are helpful. Words matter, actions are more important. And so we look forward to acting with you, but thank you for tuning in and thank you for helping us lift, lifting the veil um, on stigma against mental health. Thank you everybody.